All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm Joe Spizak. I'm a product leader at Meta, and I am here to talk about product management uh, in AI through the lens of open science. So a little bit about me before we jump into the meat of things. Um, so if you kind of had to sum me up in a single line, I would say that would be, I'm passionate about the intersection of open source, AI, and community building. I see just about everything I do as an opportunity to build community, um, you know, do things in an open way, um, and publish and actually work collaboratively with partners. So that's really what gets me out of bed in the morning and why I, I do what I do and why I, I work at what I think is the best place to do it, and that's Meta. Um, so at present, as I said, I'm a product leader in Meta AI Research, um, which is formerly known as FAIR or Facebook AI Research. Uh, I also uh, spend time uh, in the VC world as an executive in residence at the Canvas Ventures, uh, located in Portola Valley, so kind of my neighbor, uh, next door to Menlo Park here. Uh, previously, I spent about four years uh, leading a uh, product for uh, ML authoring, uh, so how essentially models were, were built and, and trained uh, across Facebook, but also a, a broader community externally. I'll talk more about that. Uh, that was really centered around PyTorch, an open source uh, framework, uh, very popular today. Uh, prior to that, I was at Amazon leading a product and partnerships in the AWS AI team. Uh, and then prior to that, I was with Intel uh, leading ML strategy for their cloud group. Um, and then before that, I spent about a decade in the semiconductor space, um, doing everything from designing system on chip um, uh, uh, technologies that go into mobile phones, all the way through to engineering, product management strategy, and almost everything in between. Um, so my career has been about a, a little bit of a tale of two, two careers, uh, one in the video and chip space, and then in AI for about the last almost decade now. So um, a brief agenda for this talk. Um, first, I'm gonna walk through just the basics of AI and how it's developed, just to baseline everyone here and who's listening. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the applications. Uh, I won't go into a, a ton of depth, but I'll show some of the, the cool areas where it's applied today, especially at, at Meta. Um, I'll jump into why open science is important. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and something I've been working on for, for a number of years now, but, but there are real reasons to operate in the open and, and to open up the technology that we're building. Uh, and then next, I'll, I'll walk through actually the, you know, really the intent of this talk, which is, you know, how AI relates to uh, different roles, but especially how uh, it relates to, to being a PM and building AI first products. And then lastly, I'll give you some uh, calls to action on ways you can dive deeper, how you can engage, um, you can be just about anyone, you can be a PM, you can be a data scientist, you can be a researcher, but there's always some way to engage. Uh, so hopefully I can give you some ideas uh, on, on how you can do that. So jumping in first and foremost into AI. So I wanna be able to ground everyone into how things are typically defined and, and how AI is actually developed. So um, for those who've kind of seen diagrams like this before, um, there's lots of definitions to AI. Uh, I tend to use one, um, in this case, uh, is any technique that enables computers to mimic human intelligence. And this could frankly be any approach. This could be uh, rules-based uh, systems, they call them expert systems, it could be you know, deep networks, uh, it could be very you know, simple linear classifiers, it could be just about anything. And of course, how we define AI or how we view AI is actually a moving target. What we actually see is, is you know, mimicking human intelligence 10 years ago has actually shifted um, you know, since then. Um, but all of that is underpinned by machine learning. So machine learning is a subset of AI that is that includes statistical methods um, that enable machines to improve with more experience, improve on tasks using more experience. And of course, experience here is data. So uh, training on this data allows machines to, to perform even better on the tasks that we want them to. And then lastly, which is a subset of ML, is deep learning. And this is really what the last decade of my career um, and what the world has been using uh, for the most part, um, especially in these kind of higher end applications, um, is, is really these deep neural networks. And these, you know, from when I started, um, uh, you know, the networks were relatively small, um, and, but they were still relatively deep for the time. Now they're massive and they're, you know, lots of layers uh, trained on just a vast amount of data um, and they can uh, perform at human level on a number of tasks. Uh, so it's very exciting kind of where things like speech and image recognition 
um, and a number of other areas have progressed over that time. And so uh, anyone who's done machine learning knows this task. Uh, this is literally the hello world of machine learning. So, uh, you know, Yama Kuhn wrote this paper, I believe it was in 1998, um, and the, the network was actually called Lynette. Um, and it was a convolutional neural network that basically would classify handwritten digits. Um, and, you know, the, the, the logical application here is you're a bank and you're automating check caching. So if you've ever submitted a check or put a check into a, into a check machine um, to cash it or deposit money, you basically use something similar to this. Of course, the techniques are much more advanced these days than uh, beyond Lynette, but the, the concept is roughly the same. I have a problem. Uh, I want to be able to understand the handwritten numbers and be able to classify them so I can actually figure out how much you know, your check is written for. Um, I have to train that model on data. So I might have this big corpus of uh, handwritten digits that have annotations, meaning there's ground truth that says that handwritten nine is a nine and, and so on. I take this model architecture, which in this case was a convolutional neural network or a CNN. I will then uh, essentially fit that. Um, it's essentially a function. I will fit that to the data um, and then basically deploy that uh, in an application, uh, say in the bank teller machine uh, that the end user then interacts with. That's a very simplified view. We'll, we'll talk a little bit uh, more about the of, of, of how things are developed, but that is kind of an end-to-end -end view of things. And of course, the data is massively important. Uh, this is the lifeblood of any machine learning model. And so you start with a training set. You know, this is how your you know, you, where your data is, is where your model is actually trained on. This is uh, uh, creates weights, um, i.e., the the function that's that's uh, that's actually developed as part of your model. Uh, you then test that on what's called a test set or even a validation set. And you, what you want to do here is see how it's doing on data that it hasn't seen. So how well is it generalizing? Um, and then, of course, the, the data itself has annotations, as I uh, mentioned. So the, the vast majority uh, of, of what's deployed today is what's called supervised learning, which we'll get to that in, I think, one or two slides here. And so output, uh, as I mentioned, is a model. And a model is really uh, this broad term of the product of all this training. So I'm throwing a lot of computer things, GPUs and CPUs. I have a lot of data. I have an algorithm. Out pops this model. And this model is just really a collection of weights that's packaged up so that when I take an input, say a new piece of data, some you know, propagation of, of things happens throughout those weights. So in this case, if I'm doing a new prediction, it's forward propagating through this network. And in this case, it's a lot of uh, matrix multiplications. That's the math that's happening. And then out comes an answer. It tells me some maybe uh, a class that it's been um, that's been recognized in the, the input data. So if I'm doing a dog and cat classifier, um, it would tell me whether it's a, a dog or, or a cat. That would be a binary classifier. And so when you kind of uh, back out into the different types of learning that happen, we typically, as I mentioned, deal with supervised learning these days. That actually means I have like annotated data. Um, typically, this is hand annotated by people, although you can, uh, there's ways to to apply this to, at scale. But these pictures on the left, um, those are hot dogs, some of them are just dogs and, you know, and so on. And you can actually uh, learn from those, those annotated uh, pieces of data. In the case of self supervised learning, which is really where things are trending, because as you can imagine, annotating data is incredibly expensive, like to pay people to say, yes, that's a dog, yes, that's a cat, you know, and obviously um, the more complex the application, the more work it takes. And, and um, you know, in case of say autonomous driving, you're, you know, you have a, a fine grain, you want to really get down to say a fine grain of classifying things around a vehicle such that, you know, it knows people, it knows, um, you know, dogs when they're walking across the street or street signs or other types of things that becomes very, very expensive. And so self-supervised is a form of training um, that basically allows you to mask or, or partially obfuscate uh, certain parts of the data, and then your model actually learn um, in the process. So in the case here, um, you, we're feeding some text, and the model is actually uh, using the model uh, using the data that's been say pre-trained on to actually fill in that blank. And so the blank jumped over the moon. Uh, the model actually infers that it it's actually looking for the word cow. Um, and this is actually a really important paradigm because this allows us to scale some of these methods without having uh, all of this 
uh, annotated data, so which is again very expensive. Uh, and then lastly, reinforcement learning, uh, and this is this is more of a uh, agent environment type of dynamic. So I might have an environment where um, you know I want to have an agent that operates within it. I want to generate rewards for that agent based on some goal that I've set for it. It has an action space, so it might you might tell it I want to I want you to um, you know in the video game scenario get the high score on a particular game. It has so it has a certain number of actions. It can move the controller in certain ways. It can press these buttons, um, and it knows kind of how that it can generate rewards or it has a reward function. Um, and what it does is actually then look through all of those, um, simulate or, or, or explore, I should say, all of those different action spaces in order to maximize that reward. Um, and this is uh, something that's applied today for things like robotics. Um, you know, we actually see this being applied in replacing A-B testing in websites. There's some really interesting applications for RL these days. So clicking down a level. So the AI workflow is, is interesting. Once you actually uh, if you've done this hands-on, you'll you'll know what I'm talking about. And again, this is fairly abstracted, so you know, um, you know, bear with me a little bit if you're very experienced in the space. So when we think about the AI workflow, um, again, at, at an abstracted level, we typically start with a problem first. Like, let's actually define clearly. Let's frame the problem. What are we trying to achieve here? Um, you know, second, there's a data prep aspect. This is where you might have raw data. You might have you might have data that you need to annotate, as we talked about. Um, and once I have that data, I can then start to prototype. I can take that data, maybe a small subset of it, and I can start to up take different approaches. I might have a decision tree. I might have a you know convolutional neural net. I might have a big transformer, um, and I might want to uh, just train and actually see what I think might actually work the best. From there, I might take the the large corpus of data, the full data, and then um, and train a large larger model um, that may, might perform even better. Hopefully, that's the goal. Um, and then from there, it's really evaluating, like how well are we doing on the desired task? And then once we're happy with the model, we deploy it into production uh, to actually serve predictions uh, at scale. So I'm gonna walk through each one of these phases really quickly. So as I mentioned, um, probably the most important part of the AI workflow is actually being able to frame the problem. Uh, and it's actually pretty interesting uh, how many times I see uh, you know, people kind of come at it from the wrong way. It's like, well, I have this, you know, model, like, I don't know what to do with it, but I've trained it on this huge, huge amount of data. Um, can it go and solve my problem? Well, you know, typically not, but, but maybe. Um, but, you know, more specifically, it's, it's actually better to, to kind of start with that problem and then work backwards. And once I've defined that problem well, um, including what that you know, input is, um, what that output looks like or output is and what success looks like, it's actually a much better way to kind of then figure out how to approach the problem. So once I've actually been able to frame the problem in a way that I can understand and, and my team can understand, we can then go and determine what data is needed. And this actually might be collecting it from a third party, uh, and licensing it, it could be an open data set, it could be something we need to generate, uh, might need uh, annotations, which again, takes time and money to go do. Um, but once there, we can start to look at, you know, um, how do we actually remove bias from it? How do we look at things like class and balance? Maybe it's got a whole bunch of, of, of uh, you know, say images of cats and I only have a few dogs. Well, it's probably gonna think everything I, I give it is a cat. Um, so that's a problem. So we need to basically think about our data and remove that, the, the imbalances and the biases and, and other aspects. From there, as I mentioned, you're gonna prototype, you're gonna uh, take a subset of that data. Uh, you might build a ton of really small models. So typically people, uh, say ML engineers or data scientists will use something like a Jupyter notebook, or, uh, you know, draft up something really quickly and just, just to kind of get a proof of concept. Um, and this ultimately gives us uh, something that we can then base a higher confidence on once we get to this training um, phase. And the reason we want to do these prototyping, uh, you know, do this prototyping before we train is because typically training these days on a large model is quite expensive. Um, you know, we, for example, train um, on say hundreds of GPUs, um, you know, for, for, for potentially months on end. Uh, and we, of course, we checkpoint um, constantly because those are quite expensive models to train. And if something goes wrong, which no model I know of has, has ever been perfectly deterministic, um, you know, we want to be able to, to stop and restart and do all those cool things. 
And then yeah, we want to evaluate. So, you know, we want, this is one of the areas where product manager is really important um, is what is success look like. And so understanding like our, is our model like, as, as evaluated, is it solving our problem? Do we have clear metrics is it hitting those metrics? Um, you know, are the outcomes for the users that we're targeting, uh, are we achieving those outcomes and so on? And then of course, you know, once we're actually ready, uh, and there's a whole bunch of things to do, um, like for example, putting monitoring and governance procedures in place. Uh, we want to ensure that the model doesn't drift um, into a place where it's doing harm um, instead of good. Um, you know, we will deploy that uh, at scale. So that is, that is a very, very high level view on, on the workflow. Um, I highly recommend getting your hands dirty with machine learning. There's a ton of, uh, ton of notebooks out there, a ton of frameworks. And so, you know, when you kind of take it all in and you, you understand, okay, that's, that's kind of the deep dive into like how the, how the sausage is made, so to speak, but what does it actually enable is really exciting. And so at Meta, for example, um, visual search, um, you know, uses these big computer vision models, um, could use object detection, instance segmentation, where I'm looking at the fine grain of the image and I'm actually able to classify and segment different objects within images or even classify uh, so like this gentleman here is wearing some rings or he's got a jacket on or, um, you know, he's got a phone. Um, so I might want to be able to, to break down that image into different components and then be able to classify each component um, with my, with my uh, classifier. Or things like natural language processing. So language translation is one of the most important ways for people to communicate. Um, you know, if you've seen the recent announcements we've had, we, we talked about uh, our, our translation efforts. This is a key for how we bring, you know, our, our over 3 billion uh, users on our platform together. And you can translate, for example, in, say, uh, Messenger or even on Facebook, uh, on, the, on the Facebook Blue app. Um, and this is really how we break down those global barriers and bring, up, bring people together from different countries. Um, and then areas like audio and speech. Uh, so in this case, this is a uh, Reels um, video and, and it actually will automatically caption um, what's happening in the, in the video. And you can just very quickly uh, use it. It uses essentially a combination of, um, uh, of, a of ASR, which is automatic speech recognition, uh, which then generates uh, from there, you can do a, you know, a speech to, to text and then generate that, uh, that text uh, that overlays you know, the video, they basically do it in, in essentially real time, which is pretty incredible when you think about the technology that actually underpins that. And then lastly, um, you know, recommender systems. So this is essentially how you personalize just about anything, whether it's your feed on, on, on Facebook or uh, what ads are personalized and, and shown to you, um, or when you're uh, flipping through, you know, uh, videos on, on reels or other, other areas, um, this actually generates those those recommendations, um, and we actually uh, recently open sourced the engine behind this, uh, which is called Torch Rack. Uh, so again, we're completely you know open source um, on, on a lot of our technology, um, and uh, you know this is kind of for everyone to build on and and use uh, to build their own applications. So switching gears a little bit over into open science again, something that's near and dear to my heart. So. You know, let's start with the definition of open science. This is a Wikipedia definition of open science. You can't get, can't get better than that, right? Uh, or, or can you? But, you know, as Wikipedia has defined it is open science is the movement to make scientific research and its dissemination accessible to all levels of society, amateur or professional. Open science is transparent and accessible knowledge is shared and developed through collaborative network. So one of the cool things about AI, and this is honestly why I got into it almost a decade ago, is it was so open, so collaborative. Uh, things are, are permissively licensed, so essentially anyone can build on it. And what I found really uh, inspiring was anyone in the world can, frankly, have an impact. You could be um, in high school in India and work on an open source project. Uh, you could be independent. You're not even working for a company yet, and you could contribute to some of the most impactful open source projects, which are used in production at big companies, enabling startups, uh, used in academia. Um, it's it's really inspiring how open science and open source has really brought this entire field forward. And so, how do we think about it? So we think about it as things like open sourcing our software. Uh, we think about you know data sets because data sets again are the lifeblood of machine learning. The models themselves, they're expensive to train. So you want to open source as many as you can because they can provide a baseline for others to use and build on. 
Uh, we want to transparently publish our papers, um, you know, on either putting them up on archive uh, or through other publications, say like Science or Nature. And then lastly, we do things like leaderboards and challenges. We want to provide some bogeys, some like targets for the community to go and aim for. And sometimes we will support these financially. Sometimes, you know, there's a, a really uh, great scientific breakthrough that can be achieved if people do well on these challenges. And this is a really great way to uh, build community. And like, if you kind of sum it all up, the way we kind of think of this is really to democratize the key technologies for the benefit of people. And, you know, the things I work on today in, uh, in some of these scientific areas, like there's nothing we're holding back. We're open sourcing as much as we can in a way that, that allows others to use it and build on it. Um, and it's really exciting. So when I boil this down to really the top three reasons uh, that open science is important, number one, you know, transparency. I alluded to this already. Transparency is really important, especially when you're building models that can impact people's lives. So, you know, things like explainability, like why the heck did that model make that prediction? And down to the a very low level, down to the neuron level, why, why is this model making predictions? You know, why is there, why, why is there bias in this particular model um, and so on? It's important to be transparent from all stages, from the data to, you know, the, uh, to the models themselves. And you're starting to see a trend, and I'll talk about that uh, in, in a couple of slides, uh, of publishing things like data cards and model cards, um, and even, method cards and this is a really important trend um, that's, that's in the space second um, open source and open science enables progress for everyone um, if you've ever tried to reproduce anything in machine learning it is incredibly difficult um, so the more you can open your work up the more others can build on top of it uh, you know in, in top labs like say fair uh, where i am you know we would hire in the past interns and they would, they would come and they would spend months just trying to reproduce a top paper. Um, and then from there, it's like, okay, we reproduced it. I can now start to think about how to build on top. Of it. How can I improve it and, and build something even better? And this is how research builds on research, builds on research, and breakthroughs actually start to happen. And then uh, lastly, you know, there's just some of these problems where, you know, no one company, you know, no one institution can drive this progress alone. So things like climate change, you know, these days, uh, more and more data sets are, are being opened up, more challenges are happening. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where no one entity, not us, not Google, not Microsoft, not, not one NGO can solve these problems. So coming together in an open way and sharing data, sharing methods, sharing, um, you know, IP, uh, collaborating, uh, it's really important for the progress, of, frankly, of our planet. And you can see on the right here, um, you know, I think the industry labs are important, and I, I agree, certainly because I work for one of them. Uh, of course, the academics are important. They're, they're pushing uh, you know, research in a number of different interesting areas. But what's near and dear to me is really the open source foundations. All of this would not be possible without, frankly, things like Archive, where people put their papers up, um, or frameworks like PyTorch, or even the Python uh, programming language, which is really the foundation of how a lot of machine learning is, is built today. And so just a couple of examples of, of things that I care about when it comes to open science, you know, PyTorch is certainly one after leading product for over four years on the project, you know, we have over 2,200 contributors, partnerships with Google, Amazon, Microsoft, OpenAI, and lots of others, academics is using it for research, but also to teach, um, and a whole bunch of users um, using it either in research uh, or production or in both, uh, in a lot of cases. And then another area, which is um, a little bit unsung, is, is education and AI and education. So this is something that we just re recently launched, um, which I'm a, a core part of, uh, which I'm really proud of, is something called the AI Learning Alliance. And this is a collaboration with a number of universities to create an open learning platform that's free to all and really tries to bring more diversity into the field of AI. Uh, this is master's level content, and we have new courses we're building. And you can go to the, uh, the portal here. You can see it in action on the right here. And you can see some of our partners. Um, you can see, you know, this is Georgia State. This is Georgia Tech. This is, you know, Alabama A&M, ASU, a number of uh, universities that we're, we're working with. And there's more on the way. Um, and are really our collective goals to bring, again, more diversity and inclusion into the field of AI and grow the overall pie for everyone.
and it's super exciting. I'm, uh, this is one of my favorite projects I work on. So uh, switching gears again over into really the premise of this talk, and this is how AI relates to, to roles. So if you remember the workflow we talked about previously, where you started with the problem and all the way to, to production. So I want to highlight just the areas where PMs are involved. And, you know, spoiler alert, they're just about everywhere. PMs are really important. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good. If you're a PM, you're involved in a lot of things. So even starting with the, the problem, the PM is incredibly important uh, and le usually leads the framing of this problem. This is typical product sense, you know. Who am I aiming for as a, as a user? Who's like, and what are those user problems I'm trying to solve? Um, what are the different possible solutions and approaches I might take? What is the North Star? These are the kind of questions you typically ask yourself as a PM, uh, classic product sense. Um, in, in AI, data prep is actually pretty important and how we actually uh, source our data or our overall data strategy. Uh, becomes incredibly important. This might be a partnership. Again, this might be strategically important. It might be data that we we source or or, or create ourselves uh, and so on. And then, um, you know, prototyping and training, depending on the type of PM you are, you might actually be involved. Who knows? Um, uh, you know, depending on how hands-on you are. But certainly evaluation at stage five um, is incredibly important for the PM to be involved as we define success back in the problem statement. Uh, we want to ensure that the model we're training actually is actually achieving the success we, we want to achieve um, based on how we're evaluating it, the metrics uh, we've agreed on and so on. And then lastly, uh, through the production the, the productionization phase, this is really the team really gets together and says, you know, really, what, what do we build? And, and is this really uh, overall, uh, does this feel like something we need, we can deploy in production? You know, is it have a, uh, acceptable levels of, of bias? Um, Cause you're never going to reduce bias to zero, um, probably ever. Uh, you know, does it meet the, the overall product requirements uh, before we actually uh, ship it in production? It is robust, you know, and and all the other questions we're going to ask ourselves, um, you know, in a in a production environment. So getting concrete with with PM. So when you think you think about it as a PM, what are really those three, you know, high level questions you're you're going to want to ask yourself? So. First off, when building AI first products, you're going to ask yourself, you know, is this a people first or a technology first um, uh, problem we're starting with? And I alluded to this earlier in the talk. And, you know, with, with AI, you can actually take both approaches. So many of these innovations uh, and these breakthroughs end up being platforms that enable other, uh, other types of applications that maybe we, we actually don't see right away. Um, and so, yes, I can absolutely start with, hey, I have a problem. Um, or I have users, I have a problem, and then have possible solutions, and I'm going to prioritize and go in just like typical product sense. Or um, what I've seen the really good PMs um, in the technology space do is see a breakthrough um, and actually start to think about like how it as a platform could enable new, new applications or new experiences that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. And that gets really exciting. So really both, both approaches are valid. The second question you might, might want to ask yourself is, you know, will you make or will you buy? Um, and in this case, what I'm alluding to is, you know, there's a lot these days of models and, and artifacts that are available kind of off the shelf. And you can take a model, you can actually prototype something within, say, even a few days or, or even a week just to get an idea. Is it actually going to fit your application? Once you get that proof of concept done... You know, you can actually then uh, maybe train a bespoke model, uh, gather more data. You can do everything kind of as normal, but but uh, but you might actually consider like taking something off the shelf because you know, frankly, making something from scratch actually can take on the order of months um, or even much longer. And then lastly, you know, your data strategy. This is incredibly important. Uh, you know, data becomes the first class citizen in everything we do um, as AI first PMs. So do we have sufficient data? Do we have you know, the volume and quantity? Do we acquire it through, again, a license? Do we generate it ourselves? Um, you know, do, we, uh, do we have to hire annotators? Um, luckily, you know, we, have, we have a way to have a platform for annotations. We can hire annotators. We have annotators on staff, um, those types of things. So, um, but, but as a PM, you need to be thinking about this. Um, and, and really this stems again from your, your problem statement. And, and you know, really what data you need to be able to solve the problem you're trying to solve. 
And then if you look at, um, as I mentioned, there's your system cards and model cards and method cards, and I'm missing the data card there. But um, you know, when you back out to everyone, you know, I can talk about data scientists, I can talk about marketing, I can talk about UX research. Um, but really, when everyone is involved, and this is really your cross-functional team as you're building products, there's really a, a handful of things that, that, that you should also take into account more broadly. Number one is AI, as I, as I mentioned, takes time to develop. So collecting data takes time, annotating it takes time. Uh, if you're running at large scale and you're training large models, those can take weeks, they can take months, they can take um, you know, a long time to even get to a proof of concept. And then even that's really where the work begins because you actually need to maybe optimize the model itself, you need to be able to ensure that it's not gonna do any, any harm. So you might actually have some like business logic that layers on top of it to ensure uh, you, know, you, you can avoid the outcomes uh, that might be detrimental to your users. Um, second, you're gonna wanna recognize the limits of AI. AI yeah, can do a lot, right? I think you can train models to do some amazing things these days, um, but it's not magic. It has limitations. Um, and so, you know, kind of understanding the state of the art in a lot of these areas is really important for you as the PM to say, okay, the state of the art is this, like, you know, um, what we're trying to achieve is that, um, you know, if, if, if it's really beyond um, what the capability of the state of the art is, then, you know, maybe AI isn't, isn't the right approach at least yet. But really understanding the limitations is, inc is incredibly important to set expectations with your team, with your organization, and so on. And then lastly, there are a lot of unintended consequences from machine learning, and it can do real harm to people. Um, and so it's, it's really important to think through those things uh, from a holistic product perspective, and then try to mitigate um, and reduce as much of that harm as possible. Um, we don't ever train models and just throw them over the wall and hope for the best. There's you know, quite a process and governance um, that we go through. Um, we try to be as thoughtful as we can because outcomes, um, you know, depending on, can, can vary deeply depending on your geography, depending on, you know, who you are, a um, number of other factors. And then just when you when you kind of roll everything up here, uh, some of the, the overall considerations, um, you know, that we think about are, you know, the governance and accountability. Um, are there, is there oversight in how we're deploying our, our models? Are we, you know, are our are, are models, you know, treating people fairly and equally? So this is where we build tools for fairness and inclusion and actually be able to measure fairness, say, uh, as we're training models or in production. Um, you know, are our models private and secure? Can we run, say, on device um, and keep data locally on the device? It's really important for privacy. You know, are our models actually operating in a way that's safe and, and acting as expected? That's where you know, robustness and tools around robustness um, are important. And then, of course, things like transparency and control. So, you know, are the our models are they explainable? Do they provide you know human agency and so on? So, I want to finish up just with a few slides to kind of give you an idea on where to, to dive deep. Um, and learn a little bit more and kind of stay in tune with what's going on. And then I'll finish up with a few uh, things that um, would be really cool for, for you as, as call to action items. So, you know, first of all, as I mentioned, this is a community. Um, and one of the things I absolutely love about this community is everyone is approachable. You can reach out to, to anyone and you can ping people on Twitter. You can, you know, everyone is really approachable. And this is really a cool community. So Jan Lacoon is all over social media these days and responds and, and Andrew Ring is one of the most approachable and, and, and well-spoken professors I've ever had um, when I was learning machine learning. Um, so there's just this incredible community of, of leaders and, and these are great folks to follow because this is, these are the folks that are really blazing the trail for this space. Um, there's also, uh, if, if anyone hasn't been to paperswithcode.com, this is a fantastic site. So if you ever want to understand what the state of the art is in just about any task you can think of, this is the site for you. So if you look at the top, uh, starting with the leaderboards, if I want to understand what the state of the art is in language modeling, even on a particular data set, I can very, very clearly understand and see the trend lines uh, and, and it makes it incredibly actionable. So over time, you can see the metrics are improving. I can actually click on that dot I can get that paper, I can get pointer to that data set, uh, I can actually get the code to train that model, I might even be able to get the model itself. Um, and that's incredibly impactful from a reproducibility perspective. 
or even like where you're starting your research. Like, you know, I want to build a language model. I don't even know what the state of the art is. Boom, I know what it is. I have a great starting point. Um, second is data sets. I think there's like over four, almost 5,000 data sets on this site now. And this is really impactful because not only can I look at the data sets based on the task that I'm trying to, uh, trying to, 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 you know, uh, achieve, um, but each data set also has different kind of terms and conditions like licensing, you know, am I able to basically train on that data set, uh, and use it for a commercial application? Maybe, maybe not, but something like this really helps me to understand that very quickly. Um, gives you kind of a summary of it, how many images, uh, in this case, um, I'm using the CIFAR data set as an example. And then lastly, methods. So this, I think, is one of the coolest things about the site is if you dive deep into these algorithms, you'll find that a lot of the layers are, you know, they're just, they're modular layers. I can take a convolution layer, I can take a rectified linear unit, which is a nonlinear function, um, and I can use those. And it's really interesting to be able to understand and dive deep into those components, understand how they're composed, what they're trying, what they're doing, um, how popular they are. So if I'm trying to, to create a bespoke model from scratch, it's really cool to be able to understand what the state of the art is and then basically be able to, to kind of use that as a foundation, even at like the lowest level. And then of course, learning. So, you know, I spent a lot of time early in my career in machine learning uh, on, you know, course taking courses on Coursera. I've built multiple courses on Udacity for PyTorch when I was on that project. Uh, these days, you can do just about anything on any of these platforms. There's, you know, traditional ML courses, there's AI and product management, there's RL courses, medical imaging, kind of the sky's the limit, and really it's, it's limited to how much time you have. And there's also degree options, which I think is really cool. So, you know, we, for example, work with Georgia Tech on the OMSCS program, that's the Online Masters of Computer Science. Uh, we teach a deep learning course uh, as part of that, that curricula. Um, and we use, of course, PyTorch for it, um, but you can actually get a full master's degree. And I've had actual colleagues do this um, at Meta uh, and get this, get a full master's uh, here. And same with uh, Columbia here also has a, uh, a master's uh, in machine learning. And I think there are a few others now since I've actually created these slides. So yeah, these are legit degrees, which is really cool. Um, and you can learn a lot and you actually, you know, grow your network uh, in, in the process. So, you know, last slide, just wanted to share a few kind of parting parting call to action items for, for folks who want to get involved. Um, so number one, if you're a product manager in building an AI first product, I think one of the coolest things you can do as a product manager is provide attribution to what makes your product possible. If you've ever seen uh, Andre Karpathy at Tesla give a talk uh, about how they built, for example, Autopilot, he will actually call out the paper, the authors, um, and and you know, really give attribution to the, the underlying research. You know, not necessarily their research, like they're building on others' research, um, and, uh, and actually give attribution to those people. And that's, I think, that is, is what makes this community really amazing. Um, and you should consider if you're building a product and there's 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 components that you, you feel you can open source, like consider doing that because it will help the community um, and and help them more broadly. Um, second. Consider spending time on challenges uh, that you think can have an impact. As I mentioned, climate change is really interesting these days. There's lots of data science type problems. If you go to Kaggle, if you go to Evil AI, uh, it's very popular right now. And these can actually have real impact in solving these problems. And this is where the power of a community can really come together. And you know, you can also win money and you can have impact and you get those cool uh, you know, Kaggle um, qualifications, Grandmaster, et cetera, if they're really good, and so on. Um, you know, if you're a researcher, for example, like open source your code, open source your model, open source your data set, uh, use the reproducibility checklist. If you search for that, my colleague, uh, Joel Pinot, um, who splits time um, over at um, Montreal, uh, she and, and some folks are really passionate about reproducibility. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's important for others to be able to build on your work uh, in a seamless way. And then lastly, just Find something you're passionate about and contribute to it, whether it's an open source project, whether it's funding a climate related uh, challenge. Um, you know, you don't have to be a hardcore coder to contribute to open source. You can build tutorials, you can help build better docs, um, you can build community and do meetups. There's all kinds of different ways to, to contribute. So I definitely implore folks to, to get involved. This is the foundation of how this community 
you know, has, has been built and how, uh, and the culture of, of, of how it, it kind of operates. So it's a really passionate community. That is it. Thank you so much for attending. I really enjoyed giving this talk. Um, and feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I've been in PM for, for a while now. If I can uh, impart any pearls of wisdom, I'd be more than glad to. But thank you again for, uh, for attending and uh, please take care.